So I don't know, you know, what you're facing today. Maybe you blew it this last week. I know I blew it some. But if God can redeem a wicked slave trader, he can redeem anybody, can he? So those of us who know him as our Savior, we have been redeemed from slavery to sin. And today, if you're here and you don't know him, you can be. There's no one past God's, Jesus' blood. So today, if you haven't received that gift, I challenge you to do that. It will be the best decision you've ever made. John chapter 2, if you find that, you're ready to roll. A few years back in um, South End, England. You know where that is, Charlie? South End, England? Yeah, okay, it's a real place. South End, England. Apparently, quite a few dentists were getting really, really frustrated because there was this man who continued to go from dentist clinic to dentist clinic with a an em needing emergency treatment, he said, and he... he he insisted on general anesthetic because of what he said was the tooth causing him excruciating pain. However, on each occasion, he, when he went into the clinic and the dentist began the examination, they found that he actually had false teeth. So you see, folks, what happens is sometimes is we get deceived, don't we, right? And the smartest we are, the smartest of it, we all get tricked sometimes, don't we? Right, we all, oh, wow, oh, I fell for that one, didn't I? You've been there, I have too. 
And as we're going to see today, that um, sometimes being deceived, sometimes being tricked, can be very, very costly. Let's bow together and um, let's just pause for a moment before I even pray. I want us just to kind of just clear our minds and thoughts of everything else. I want us to um, just bring ourselves before the Lord right now. Lay it all before Him. That's what we're here for today is to know Him better and, and allow ourselves to know ourselves better. Dear Heavenly Father, as we... As we continue in your presence today, as we move now into this time in which we're going to be looking into your word, this book that you have preserved in its completed form for 2,000 years, there is no book on the planet like it, still today, as throughout all the centuries, the best seller, the best seller every year, changing lives every day. As we look into it today, help us to see the truth contained in it, help us to see how it relates to our personal lives, and then stir our hearts to respond to its message. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I want us to draw our focus once again to, um, to the topic, to the theme that we are, have been looking at, because it is so, so critical. I don't think, really, I don't think we have ever engaged in a more important study than this. And... Um, I want, I want each of us to, to really today try to, to stay focused and try to, to really see Jesus today. Now, I don't mean visibly see him, but, but I mean to see who he is because he gives us a lot of information. He goes, and we'll see today, he bends over backwards informing us who he is. He doesn't call for blind faith, nothing close to that. If you're... If you're seeking today, we'll, we'll look carefully so you can see who he is. Um, if you've so far kind of ticked him off the list thinking he's, he's, he's nothing, well, keep your mind open. Listen carefully today. And if you're already a believer, uh, there's really nothing in our lives more important than to know him better and better every day. And we're going to see the practical point in that today. So currently in our study, we are um, we're, we're trying to deeply understand this first point, come and see. That's what we're at. That's what we're looking at. We've learned over these weeks that these three steps are meant to be progressive. There's to come and see. That's where it begins for everyone. And that's primarily for seekers. Then there's the, the, the next step to follow me and then to go and make disciples. We've learned that these five men that we've been looking at um, as the first ones to come and see, and for us today, Jesus also taught them, and this has been really important, I hope you're really getting this, that he didn't just teach them come and see, he taught them what, and he taught them why. Now, now think with me just for a moment, all right? Just imagine with me, you're walking this week, maybe you're going into the supermarket, whether that be Pack and Save or Countdown or New World or Foursquare or, or wherever, and somebody comes to you and says, come, come look, come see. What are you going to ask them? Come see what, right? Okay, so what is important? What is it that we are coming to see in, in, this, in this study? What is it? What is the what? It is the, the good news, the gospel. That's exactly right. That is the what. And that is what Jesus wants every person to be informed about. He wants them to know what the good news is. All right. Now, there's also the why. And um, so you think about these men that, that Jesus first calls. I mean, they were busy men. They were fishermen. They had occupations. It wasn't like they were, you know, sitting on the courthouse steps twiddling their thumbs, you know, waiting for somebody to scoop them up. No, they were busy. And today, through each century, we, we are each busy. And so the why is the question. Why should I come and see, first of all? Why, could I, why should I have a look at this gospel thing? And then for those who have come and seen and said, yes, this is truth and I want this for my life, then, then why should we take the time out of our busy schedules to tell others? And we saw two really, really important reasons a few weeks ago. The first one, and don't miss the significance of this, every person is making the choice which determines their eternal destination. You see the point of that? It's in your hands. It's in each individual hands. God does not. God does not say, I pick this person, and I pick this person, and I pick this person. Frankly, Jesus died for everyone, and they choose. And so that's significant. It helps. Why do we need to tell everybody? Because we need to let them know they're making a choice. 
every human being, all the, what is it today? Is it 7.9 billion-ish people, something like that? Every one of them are making a choice, and that's an eternal choice. So that's important. The second thing we saw, we spent quite a bit of time on it a few weeks ago, is the fact that the lake of fire is a real place. We can imagine it does not exist. We can wish it did not exist. But the Bible's clear it does exist, and it's a horrible eternal place. And it is one of the two eternal destinations. So that is a why. That is a big why to think about this and to communicate this. Now, I believe we need to talk a bit more about the, the why. Um, excuse me, the what before we carry on. And specifically, the, the come and see what. All right, we're going to talk about it a bit today. The gospel itself, I want to make this clear, is all, is all that anyone needs to know to become a follower of Jesus Christ. That's it. Okay? That is all. It doesn't matter if they haven't read any other parts of the Bible. It doesn't matter if they've never walked into a church. The gospel is all they need to know. All right? It is not in any way complex or lengthy. Okay? It, it is not. It is, and I'll get the guys to put the next slide up on the screen. It is simply the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4. Paul made it clear. That is the gospel. All right, that's what Jesus did. The gospel is simply, next slide, turning. It's that simply, let me, let me illustrate it physically up here. Once again, you're living life your way. Every, all 7.8 billion are living life their way. Maybe they're not a horrible person, but they're doing their thing. And they come to the point where they learn of the good news. They learn of Jesus Christ. And they, at some point, make the choice to turn. And instead of resting in whoever, whatever they've rested in before, they now rest in Jesus Christ. They place their faith in Him to forgive their sins and be their Savior. That is salvation. You say, well, that's, that's pretty simple. Exactly. God bent over backwards to not complicate it. It is the gospel, pure and simple. And... And yes, now I'm going to, let's do it carefully because you can get confused here in what I'm about to say, and I don't want that to happen. All right. Uh, we've been over backwards also saying over the last few weeks that one of the big problems in the church today is that so many Christians, true followers of Jesus Christ, they're stuck at come and see. They've parked it there, some of them for decades, and they're coming every Sunday, and they're listening, and yeah, that's great, and all that kind of stuff, and that's it. They're not moving forward to follow me. They're not doing Christ example. They're not telling anybody else. They're not involved in ministry. Okay, so what I'm about to say could confuse you. Listen carefully. I don't want to minimize that point, okay? Because you see, that's the process that must take place. We become, first of all, we're, we come and see, and then we follow Jesus Christ. But you see, even those who are followers of Jesus Christ, and even those who move into that totally mature step to where not only are they doing it, they're doing it independently, and they're leading others to do it, Here's what I want you to understand, is there continues to be the need to learn more and more about Jesus Christ. Are you, you see what I'm saying here? We move past the come and see step in our, in our life, and our actions, but we never stop learning. We never stop learning who he is. In fact, and, and if you're a Christian this morning, listen to what I'm saying. This is so important. That's why our lives get so dead as Christians sometimes. That's where our vibrancy comes from. That's where it comes from in my life. If I, if I go for a while, I'm not really in God's word, not really focusing on him, I get dead. I get non-vibrant. But every time I get a new picture of who he is, and I'm going to tell you what, there's 75 trillion zillion new understandings about Jesus Christ. You're never going to get them all. Every time I see more deeply who he is, it makes me more vibrant. And you know what else? It makes me want to tell somebody about this. So I want you to understand that we never stop learning, Okay. That continues on, and we're going we're to see that today. It's going to unfold for us um, as, you, as, you, as you hear what I'm about to say. Here's another reason why it's important for us to keep learning as Christians. Most people, this is important, most people will not choose Jesus until they know more about Jesus than the gospel. You hear what I'm saying? Most people, it happens sometimes, but most people... They may hear the gospel, but they're going to want to know more until they make that choice because it is a huge choice. All right, are you following what I'm saying? I'm not saying the gospel is not enough, and some do. First time they hear the gospel, boom, they accept it. That's very rare. Usually, though, they're going to want to know more. So what does that mean for us who are Christians? We need to be knowing more about Jesus Christ to share with them. 
Are you following what I'm saying here? You're seeing how, how practical this is for all of us, no matter where you are in this, this journey. In fact, it's probably frightening if, if someone said to you this morning and they said, tell me, tell me about Jesus, how long would that conversation last? Right? How much would you have to tell them about Jesus? That should be able to go on and on and on in questions they have about Jesus. I'm not saying that we, we don't know the answers to every question, but we need to be growing more and more about that. And let's, let's be fair, too, though, this morning. The flip side is also true. Some of you may be here this morning, and, and you've already kind of, like I said at the beginning, you've ticked Jesus off the list, not, not him. He's, he's a deceiver. He's, he's not who they say he is. How well do you know him? Right? How well have you really checked him out? Have, how well have you really checked the evidence out? You know, before you write anybody off the list, it's, it's only fair to give them a chance. And what ways, what rests on this decision, I think definitely behooves us to listen to the evidence, right? And we're going to hear some more this morning. And I think it's going to be interesting for all of us. So, therefore, I say all this because of our human need to understand, Right? Our, we're, we're, we're lacking in, you know, we're lacking in knowledge. We're lacking in, in all these things. And so because of that, and we're going to see this today, Jesus goes to great pain and effort to, in an amazing color and detail, reveal himself. He does. He did. And he is. And we're going to see some things this morning. Two we saw last week. Number one was Jesus is supernatural. Okay? Jesus is supernatural. And we saw last week he performed his first miracle. He took plain water and turned it into wine. As I said last week, nobody can do that. If they could, they would be very wealthy, right? And it would shut down Hawks Bay's economy because who needs grapes anymore, right? But Jesus did that. Who can do that? God. Supernatural, the word supernatural means something that's attributed to some force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature, Right? How can that be done? How can you take water and turn it into wine? There's no scientific explanation for that. Jesus is supernatural. So, listen to me carefully. We'd better take him seriously, right? I mean, we better take him seriously. That's just common sense. Number two we saw last week, Jesus fears no one. Jesus fears no one. He went into the temple, into this very structured religious system, Okay, I didn't say godly system. I said religious, and that day it was very religious. It was very structured. And he went in, and he turned things upside down. And no doubt he made a lot of people mad, and he just walked right through it. Okay, why? Because he was standing up for his father and what was right. And what was happening in that temple was so dishonoring to God. There was so much corruption happening, and he dealt to it. He's not afraid of anyone. And if you remember last night, there was one main, last time there was one main warning this brought to us. Do you remember what that was? You don't want to be on the wrong side of Jesus. All right? Is he loving? Is he ever? So, I mean, he died for us, okay? But there is a wrong side of Jesus. And that's, that is an eternally wrong side. And you don't want to be found there. We looked at Revelation chapter 20 last week, as you'll remember. One of the most horrific events recorded in God's word, yet to take place. Fortunately, yet to take place. You don't have to stand there. Right now, as it sits, there are probably are people in this auditorium who are scheduled for that event at that judgment. And there, are no, there is no one found innocent at that judgment because they're judged based on their works, not on their name being written in the book of life. It's a horrible event. Jesus is the judge there. You could this morning change it to where you don't have to stand at that event by placing your faith in him. That simple. That could change today. Now, for you grammarians and those of you that are really into literature, there's a, there's a really interesting literary structure situation at the end of chapter 2. So you're at chapter 2 right now. And you notice it goes down, I think it's verse 25 is where it ends. And then it goes to what chapter 3 in our Bibles. You notice that? You say, yeah, okay, duh, big deal. Well, I think it's important. Several things to understand. I know many of you know this. The Bible was not re- originally written with chapters and verses. There were the separate books written, but not chapters and verses. It just read, like if you read in the Old Testament Hebrew, it, it reads backwards, so you just read like that, and you kept going through the whole book. Or if it was in the New Testament, Greek and Aramaic, you just read through. There was no chapter and verse divisions. Those were put in later to help us to kind of know where to turn to in, in a certain situation. Um, I believe that 
probably that break there between chapter 2 and 3 shouldn't be there. Because actually, when you, when you, and we'll see it this morning, when you really look at the flow, it seems to just flow right through. You know, typically you see it when there's a new chapter, there's a total change in thought or event. That's not happening here. There is a change of location, but not a change of thought. Because look at verse 25. How does it end there? It says, for he himself knew what was in man. We'll look at this in a moment. And then verse 1 goes, now there was a man. And in a moment you're going to see what I'm saying. It just, what happens is chapter 3 explains what he means in chapter 2. So we're going to see that this morning. Now something also interesting is as chapter 2 draws to a close, as we're going to see, we would tend to think, wow, Jesus must be happy about what's happening here. Okay? So let's read it. Look at verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Okay, you see that? That sounds good, right? I mean, hey, this is it, right? We talked about this a lot a few weeks ago, how that Jesus accomplished these things, such as changing water to wine and other things, to help people to believe. He did not just simply walk up and say, I'm the Son of God, believe in me or else. He did not do that. He went far beyond that. He gave evidence after evidence after evidence. All right. So you see this happening. Verse 23, you say, okay, great. He's doing these miracles and people are believing. Great, right? Probably not, actually. Let's keep reading. Verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself, noticed this, he himself knew what was in man. Now, we cannot, I say this with all certainty, we cannot know what is in the heart of another person, right? We think we can. We get in trouble sometimes because we, because we thought we did know, but we can't. We can, I mean, we, can watch, we can watch what they do and what they say and how they act, and we can make you know, fairly educated guesses at what's in their heart, but we can be really, really, really wrong sometimes, right? And we can miss it. Sometimes it happens between husbands and wives, and that causes a bit of, of tension, right? We can, we can think we know what's their intention and what's in their heart, what their true inner attitude is, but we can't know. There's a story I want to tell you. Um, I heard this originally told by Charles Swindoll a number of years ago, but it illustrates this point, I think, in the, probably better than any other thing I've ever heard. So the story goes about a, a young law attorney in the state of Texas, and he was in a big law for, firm, and the, the, the head of that firm was a very, he was a traditionalist. And many of you know that the fourth, thank you guys, the fourth Thursday of every November in America is what? Thanksgiving Day, that's right. And it's big. It's really, it's a really, really important time in American culture. Okay. So anyway, so this, this, the, the, the manager of this law firm, every Thanksgiving, they had a big, you know, you've seen on television, you know, the law firms have these really big tables where they all meet around it. So on that big oak table every year, he would have turkeys laid out on the table. So every lawyer in the firm got a turkey, kind of a traditional thing. And and they would receive their turkey and thank, thank them for letting them work for the firm and all that. Well, this one young attorney, you see, you got to understand, he was, he was single, he lived alone, and he didn't need a big turkey. And so every year he has this big turkey. And so what does he do with it every year? Well, his friends knew all about that. And so they decided this year to play a big trick on him. Okay, so they they took his turkey. I don't know how they did this. They got by with it, but they took his turkey out of the wrapping, you know, kind of like what you see on the screen there, and they replaced it with a paper mache turkey. All right, yeah, and they so to make it feel heavy like a turkey, they put lead in it and all, and they wrapped it back up, and it looked just like the real thing. So anyway, so this guy, this young guy's term comes, and he comes up, and he, he receives his turkey and thanks his boss and all that kind of stuff. And then later that afternoon, he's on the bus heading home, and he's got this, this big turkey sitting in his lap, and he's thinking, what am I going to do with this turkey, you know? So a bit later, um, a man, very discouraged-looking man, boards the bus and sits down next to him, and they begin talking about the the coming holiday, Thanksgiving and all, and he learns that this man has been searching all day for, for work and has found nothing. And the man begins talking about how, you know, he's going home to his family, he has nothing for them for Thanksgiving, for tomorrow, and the young attorney gets an idea. So he says to him, 
He says, well, I can't, he thinks, I can't give him this turkey because if I give it to him, that's going to hurt his pride. So he says, well, how much money you got on him? And the guy looks in his wallet, he has $2. He says, sold. The turkey's yours. The guy said, really? He said, yep, yeah, you, you take the turkey. That's yours. And the man was just literally to tears, was overwhelmed. Now he has a meal for his family, right? And so he gets off the bus shortly thereafter and says, God bless you. How wonderful. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll never forget you. Okay, yeah, I know. You're, you're rolling with me here, aren't you? So the following Monday, they're all back at work, and all of his mates, you know, they just can't wait to hear how he reacts when he opens his turkey up and sees what it is and all. And when he tells them the story, I mean, they're horrified. They realize what has taken place here. And so literally, they, they all rode the bus for a whole week trying to find this man to tell him what the truth was, but they never found him. And, and you know, I, I suppose to this day, that man still thinks, you know, that there is a, a, a lawyer who is a heartless scoundrel who did him wrong and, and tricked him out of his last two dollars, when in reality, what? That is wrong. That's not the truth. And so, folks, it just goes to show us we can, man, I've got all the evidence. I know what's in that person's heart. No, we don't. But God does. He absolutely does truly does. There's a verse, I'll get the guys to put on the screen, 1 Corinthians 2.11 that tells us, it says, for who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? We can't know, but God does. And, and then another caution that comes with that too, you know, that really comes right beside it. Be careful how quickly you judge Jesus Christ, right? God, I know what he's about. You know, he was just a, he was just a good man, but he's not the son of God. Then he's a liar. Boom, right? <laughs> Be careful how quickly we judge anybody, most certainly be careful how quickly we write off Jesus Christ. You know, we can't know another person, but Jesus Christ does, and he shows us that. So the third thing is Jesus knows our inner heart. And we see that, we saw that in the verses that we just read. He knew what was in their hearts. And because of that, he, you see, he knew. He knew that Many of them, okay, they're coming, and, you know, you, you read about it, the crowds are growing. I mean, big crowds, thousands and thousands. I mean, there was one of those events that we can estimate there were probably about 12,000 people at least that were there to hear Jesus speak and all. And, wow, great, they're all turning to Jesus, putting their faith in him. No, probably they were coming to see another miracle. Okay, they were coming to see. But I thought the miracles were there to help them believe, yeah. But, you see, they're coming to see the miracles. They're not coming to believe in him. They're not seeing him as the one that can fix their problem of sin that's separating them from God. They're just seeing him coming for a free show. And Jesus knows their hearts. He knows their hearts. But I want you to think about that for a minute. There's some encouragement there. Think about this. Jesus knows our heart, every single thing. There is nothing, no thought, no attitude, nothing we've mumbled about inside that he doesn't know about. And he loves us just the same. Would anybody else do that? <laughs> you know, some of the things we thought about our friends, you know, they wouldn't say to them, would they still love us if they knew what we thought? Jesus does. He does. And in the midst of this, once again, if you think about that, in the midst of this, you know, incomprehensible complexity, Jesus makes it simple. And that's our fourth thing we learn about Jesus is Jesus makes it simple. We spoke about this at the, in the beginning. The gospel is all we need. That is the message. That, that simply in itself is enough to bring us to a right relationship with the God of this universe. And it is not complicated. And here in, in John chapter 3 is recorded what I believe is one of the most significant conversations in the Bible. It's a conversation between Jesus Christ and Nicodemus. Um, I personally believe the book of John is one of the greatest books in the Bible for a seeker to read. Because it reveals so much about Jesus Christ. And maybe John chapter 3 is the greatest chapter to read. Because as we're going to see in it, is contained some of the most clearest understanding of the gospel message. So look at verse 1 with me. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, understand this. Nicodemus was the cream of the crop. Okay, he, he, was the, in the, he was at the top of Jewish society. Absolutely. He was very respected as a Pharisee. But notice also it says ruler of the Jews. So what that meant was that he was a, part, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body of the Jews. About 70 men who sat there. I'll put a quote on the screen here that helps us understand that. It says, as the highest court of ju ju judicature, remember how you pronounce that, 
in all cases and over all persons, ecclesiastical and civil supreme, its decrees were binding, not only on the Jews in Palestine, but on all Jews wherever scattered abroad. So Nicodemus was a powerful man, very, very powerful. Look at verse 2. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. So he's believing in Jesus, but he doesn't quite understand yet. Notice verse 3. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now think about this man, Nicodemus. Okay, I don't think they measured IQ levels in that era, but if he had been measured, I guarantee his would have been through the roof. All right, Revered teacher, but he doesn't understand the gospel yet. doesn't matter how much he understands about everything else, he doesn't understand the most important thing. Look at verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So scholars vary here. Do, are they thinking that he really is missing the point so much that he's thinking that Jesus is saying you got to get back into your mother's womb again? Maybe, or maybe, I personally think he, he had more of a clue than that. But he's saying, how can you, at a later stage in life, get a restart? Because humanly speaking, that's not possible either. Humanly speaking, that's as impossible as... As, you know, ever how many kgs you weigh now getting back inside your mother's tummy again, right? And all mothers are horrified at the thought, right? Yeah. Both are impossible, a restart. But Jesus is somehow saying being born again. So there's a restart there, obviously. Verse 10, skip down a few verses. Verse 10, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? And notice that, and it's very clear in the original language in the Greek, it's the teacher. It's clearly, it's clearly not a teacher. Jesus said, you're not the teacher. So Nicodemus was the man. When it came to, to, to religious knowledge, he was apparently the expert there in it. And Jesus is saying, how is it, Nicodemus? You had the Old Testament scriptures. They spoke of me. How is it that you've read them? You can, and no doubt, without, with, for certainty, Nicodemus could have quoted the entire first five books of the Bible. That was a requirement for any Pharisee, let alone you know, this guy here. And yet he missed it. And you know what? That's the horrible, scary thing, is there are people on this planet today with IQs that would shoot through the roof, and they're missing the most important and simple truth of all. And at this moment in time, Nicodemus... Is missing it. You see, whatever, what really matters, Nicodemus misses it. He understood religion. You see, and that was the problem. You see, they had complicated everything. They had, some, and they added, I mean, yes, the Old Testament, praise God, we don't live in the Old Testament era today, right? You want to go have pork today for lunch? Go for it, okay? They couldn't in the Old Testament. We can, right? As well as a whole lot of other things. And then they added laws and laws and laws on top of it. They had as many as 300 things they had to remember to do. And they complicated and they had to do all that thing right just to hope they could get to God. God never taught that. That is not what was taught in the Old Testament. They mistaught it. And that's where Nicodemus was. He was missing it. At this point in time, he was missing it. And you think about ourselves today, all right? Um, I get the guys to put another slide on the screen. We, we do this, most of us do this regularly. You're downloading a new app, right? Or a new, new program or something online. You bought something online. And there's always what? This, this long thing that you're meant to supposed to be reading and then you click the accept button, right? And we all read every word of that before we click accept, right? No, we don't. No, we don't, right? Of course we don't. We just don't. Why? Because we, you know, we, what happens? We get lost in the burdensome complexity and length of it, and so we, we click accept, right, because of that. And, and truth is, if we read it all, we wouldn't understand half of it, right? And so complexity drives us crazy. That's why, ladies, I want to explain this to you, okay? Us guys are not just stubborn. The reason we don't read the instructions before we put stuff together is because it's too long, Okay, if it's pictures, right, we might would do it, but it's too long, and we're that way. We don't like complexity, and you see, that's not what the gospel is. Think about it. The, the most complex, well, we, we can't even comp comprehend what his mind could be like, but he makes it simple for us. So let's pay close attention. Let's pay close attention, because here in these next verses that we're going to read, we're going to hear probably one of the clearest explanations of how any human being 
can have peace with the God of this universe. How anyone can know that they're right with God. That at any moment of any day, they can know that they're okay with the God of this universe. This is how. And Jesus, as he talks in Nicodemus, is going to explain it. So go down to verse 14. Go down to verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what's being talked about there? Some of you know, you're familiar with the Old Testament, some of you are not. Numbers chapter 21, once again, the children of Israel are whining and complaining and arguing with God because they don't like what's happening. And so God has been patient over and over, and he realizes, okay, they're going to have to learn the hard way. And so what happens is he releases poisonous snakes to go out, and it begins biting them, and they begin dying from these poisonous snakes. And then Moses prays for the people, and God says, okay, Moses, do this. Raise up a, a pole, and on that pole put a serpent, and if they will believe in me and look to that serpent, then they can be healed. They won't die. And that's exactly what happened. So what's, what's Jesus saying right here then? He's saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What's he saying? He's already talking about his death on the cross. Or this is, you know, three years yet of ministry ahead of him. He's already talking about his death on the cross. And he's saying, and Nicodemus knew that account very, very well. He's saying, Nicodemus, as those people looked at that serpent on that day and were healed physically, people will be able to look at my death on the cross and be healed spiritually by looking and believing. Pretty simple, eh? Verse 15, keep reading with me, noticing these simple truth Full words. That whoever, now what does whoever mean? That means everybody, right? Yep. That whoever believes, that means you got to do a lot of good things and maybe you get there, right? No, it means who believes, right? Place their faith in him may have what? Eternal life. I mean, look at that. Just that, what is that? Six words? Seven, eight words? That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Boom. Not by praying to the different saints, not by crawling on your knees up to whatever it is, not by being a good person, because why? We can't be good enough. Nobody can. God knew that. I mean, think about how ridiculous religion is. If a person, if one person could be good enough to work their way to heaven, which would mean they'd have to be perfect, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? And he said, I must go to the cross, because God knew we couldn't. Beautiful verses here. Let's keep reading. Verse 16, we've already quoted this once today, right? For God so loved. Notice that. Every time you're thinking about how mean God is, remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I know I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Those of you that are not parents cannot fully grasp the depth of that verse. I didn't until I became a parent. Until you know the love of a child. How you know you would jump in front of that bus a hundred times before you let your child fall in front of that bus. How you know that. And yet Jesus, God, allowed Jesus to die. And, you, and, and I've actually read this. It, 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 it angers me. But people say, yeah, look how mean God was. He threw his son on the cross. They don't understand a father. All right? I'll assure you that the father suffered in heaven far more than Jesus did as he watched his son. God could have stepped in at any moment thinking truthfully, they're not worth it, son, get back up here with me. But he didn't. You know, we think about the injustices on this earth. Are there injustices? Are there things that we can't understand? Why did this person die? Why did that happen to that person, that innocent person? Yes, those things happen. The greatest injustice that ever occurred in the universe was God's holy, pure son dying on a cross. And what did God do then? Nothing. He did nothing then. So what have, what have we really got to complain about? He allowed that to take place. Keep reading with me. So that whoever, what does whoever mean again? Everybody believes, just that, believes in him. I mean, we talked about the lake of fire. They would not have to perish. They don't have to perish. That's, that's actually a choice people choose. But instead have eternal life. How long is eternal? Yeah, right, that's right, eternal. Verse 17 this is such a wonderful verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus didn't come down here to condemn people. He came in here to save people. In verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Boom. It's that simple. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, 
I don't care if that was last week or 20 years ago, you are not condemned. Not because of what you did or how well you did, but because of what he did. But whoever, there's only one, there's, you know, there's no stride in the fence, it's one or the other. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. What that means is if, if you're choosing to say no to Jesus Christ right now, can condemnation already rest on you. It's one or the other. Why? Because he wasn't as good as those people. No. It's because, one simple thing, look at it, verse 18, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It's that simple. Two verses I love, John 6, 47. I'll get the guys put on the screen. Probably one of my very favorite verses in the Scripture because of just how wonderful encouragement, encouraging it is. It says, most assuredly, as you see, most assuredly, this is Jesus speaking. And as I've said many times, that most assuredly is a very powerful Greek statement. It's almost like Jesus is taking somebody's head in their hands, hands and saying, listen to what I'm saying. You know, you ever do that with your children? Would you listen to me, please, right? Okay, you wives want to do that to your husband sometimes, don't you? Maybe you should. It says, most assuredly, Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, listen to the simplicity, he who believes in me has, not will have, has everlasting life. God made it so simple for us. I love that verse. I, I probably say that verse every day. And then another one that was stated a bit later by the Apostle Paul, John or Acts 10, 43. Remember who he was, by the way, the Apostle Paul. I mean, this was the guy who was killing Christians, right? He was, he was ISIS of the first century, okay, to the max. Here's what he wrote. He says, he said this, to him... All the prophets bear witness. In other words, he's saying, in the Old Testament, who were they talking about? Jesus. They were talking about Jesus. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone, listen to this, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Boom. Once again, the simplicity, the beauty, the wonderful truth that's contained in that verse. And here here also comes another powerful evidence that Jesus is who he said he is. Think about it. Who are we talking about here now? Nicodemus. Once again, very intelligent man. Very intelligent man. And society had everything going with him, going for him. And and catch this. Don't miss this now. He is a leader of the group of people who hate Jesus. He is a leader of the Pharisees, and they hate Jesus, and ultimately they will kill Jesus. All right? You know what unfolds. Okay? And yet, eventually, Nicodemus places his faith in Jesus. Why? Why would he do that if he's not who he says he is? A bit later on, you need to turn there. In John chapter 7, we find Nicodemus again. Here he is rebuking the Pharisees for condemning Jesus verbally without giving Jesus a chance to speak for himself. So we see how he's already swayed. And then in John chapter 19, who is it that helps Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus? It's Nicodemus. Obviously, now he's become a believer. He helps to bury Jesus Christ. And so this man, please don't miss this. I know there's some intelligent people here, and yet, here's the thing. Nicodemus, an intelligent man, had every reason to reject Jesus Christ, and yet he places his faith in him. Now, as we move to chapter 4, there is going to be an encounter between Jesus Christ and a person. Catch this. This person for numerous reasons, is at the very opposite end of the social ladder than Nicodemus. They are at the bottom of it. And yet this conversation is interesting. It's one of my favorite conversations in the Bible. I can't wait to look at it, but we're going to have to wait because we're out of time. So next time we're going to look at this conversation. But what have we seen today? Once again, we've got these three things. All right, come and see, follow me, go and make disciples. Question for all of us today, how well have we come to see? Those of you that are still seeking, still trying to figure it out, you know, that's a question worth asking yourself. How well are you looking? I I can promise you there's no question you'll grapple over. You may buy a house one day. You may get married one day. You may make big choices about careers and all those kind of things. Those, Those are nothing. Those are nothing compared to this decision. And for Christians here today, how well are you getting to know Jesus Christ? How well are we getting to know him? And I want, us to, remind, I want to remind us of this, that, that being deceived, being tricked can sometimes be deadly. There's a, there's a fish known as the hairy frog fish. All right, I'll get the guys to put it on the screen. The hairy frog fish. You say, there's a fish? 
Next, show them the eye, pick out the eye, and you can see the kind of make out the next slide shows. Okay, see, can you see the fish kind of? Not really, no. He, I mean, he lives by deception. That's how he makes his living, okay? In fact, you see that? Put the circle around the next thing there, guys. You see that? That's actually part of him. That's an appendage that he hangs out there, and he, he moves it up and down. You can't tell in the picture there. It kind of looks like a, a worm jiggling around. Everybody knows fish love to eat worms. So what does he do? You got it. He shakes that little worm up and down. A little fish comes to have a bite, and next slide, boom, the fish becomes dinner. Okay, just like that. Because why? Because they were deceived. You know, let's be careful, folks. Being tricked can sometimes be a ha-ha-ha. Sometimes it can be fatal, very, very fatal. There's a song that, um, that I want us to, um, I think next week, I think the worship team are going to teach it to us. I, I've heard this song numerous times, and, and often, you know, you, I berate you guys, and I'm going to continue to do it when you've got your downtime, when you're driving, when you're working, and you don't have to be, when you can have headphones on. Be listen to Christian music or be listen to good teaching. I was doing that this week, and I actually heard a line in the song that I'd heard a bunch of times, but I finally I heard the line. It really got my attention. And I'll get them to put the, it, the name of the song is With Every Act of Love by Jason Gray. Here's the first, the first line. It says, we bring the kingdom come. Now, what does that mean, we bring the kingdom come? Well, the, uh, eschatologically, the kingdom of God, the thousand-year reign, is at least seven years from now. But Jesus also said, you know, what was that prayer? You know, your will be done, your kingdom come, your will be done. What does he mean? We need to be preparing the way for it. How do we do that? Well, this song talks about it. We bring the kingdom come with every act of love. Jesus, help us carry you alive in us. Your light shines through with, av- with every act of love. We bring the kingdom come. But this next part of the song is what really got my attention. I'll get the guys to put that on the screen. Look at this, look at this line here. It said, God put a million, million doors in the world for his love to walk through. One of those doors is you. If you know Christ is your Savior, you've experienced the love of God. And, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. And that love can shine through in a, in a million different ways. The question is, is it? Is it? Are we, are we, is it all self-focus? Me, 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 how's my day going? Or are, we, are, we able, are we willing to step out of ourselves and as Christians let that love show through? Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God that you've preserved. We thank you that we are so blessed here in this country. We can own a Bible, we can read a Bible with fear of no persecution, with fear of, no fear of imprisonment or, or death. That may change one day, but for now we have it available to us and we can study in a group setting just like this. Thank you for that. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for how you've helped us to see your son, Jesus Christ, more clearly today. I don't know where you are today in this journey. You may be still trying to figure it out. I urge you to hasten that journey. None of us are guaranteed another day. Search it out. Know who he is and place your faith in him to forgive your sins. Many here today have made that choice. You've received him as your savior. You're you're a child of God. But the question for for us then is, is the love showing through? Are we a follower of Jesus Christ? As we follow his steps, we see love oozing out of him. Could that be said of us? In this quiet moment, I urge us to make a decision that will change our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that all that we know, all that we read of you in your word is true. We also thank you that you promise us that you will give us the strength for the journey, that you will answer the questions that we need answered so we can understand who you are. I pray as we go out today that not one person will leave this building the way they came in. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Lead me to the cross where your love